Good morning and welcome. This is the Veterans Forum. Today is the 18th of September, 2007. We're at the studios of Pittsfield Community Television here in Pittsfield, Massachusetts. For those of you who do not know, uh, we are honored to have some of our guests share some of their experiences during the war and let you share them with them. We invite anybody, male or female, who has a story as such to share with us. Please get in touch with us. We'll tell you how later on so that everybody, you included, can have a chance to relive some of the good stuff. Today's guest is, I got to read it, but David McCandless. He's from Great Barrington. Good morning, young man. Well, and thank you, Bob. <laughs> anytime, Kitty. <laughs> Seriously, uh, for the record, would you give us your name and spell your last name and your date of service? David McCandless. M-C-C-A-N-D-L-E-S-S, -S. and uh, I entered active duty uh, in April of 1943, and uh, uh, became a citizen again uh, July 4th, 1946. Went from lieutenant to PFC, huh? Proud That's first right. civilian, good deal. <laughs> <laughs> well, to kind of build a little history to find out who and yeah. what you were, could you go back a little bit and tell us where you were born, when, and how it was growing up back in, quote, the good old days before you went into the service? I was born in uh, Elizabeth, New Jersey, because that's where my dad was working at the time, and um, lived there for, several, for a few years as a youngster, and then New York City, and then with the Depression, we uh, gravitated back to my mother's mother's home. Wow. So I, I really grew up in Great Barrington in my grandmother's home. And uh, mother and dad would visit. Mother was there a lot. And uh, um, anyway, that was the Depression time and we did the best we could. And, and uh, so I went to school in Great Barrington, Bryant School. And then uh, I was lucky enough to go to Berkshire School. I say lucky enough because it was a good entry to college. So I uh, uh, went off to Cornell in uh, 1941. And, and, oh, uh, good. And uh, from, from there, here was the war. And uh, um, I joined the uh, enlisted reserve because they said oh, I could stay in college another year or so if I did. And of course, I got called up by the enlisted reserve rather than the draft board. Now, do you have any brothers or sisters that you shared this growing up with? I had a brother, and um, he uh, uh, was going into medicine, and uh, so uh, uh, we all thought that he was probably going to become a doctor in the Army, too, but uh, uh, he'd had a bad heart, so... Uh, they didn't take him. Oh, no, so I was the only one. <laughs> I see. Now, uh, you were telling me earlier that uh, you you are a persona non grata in effect at Drake Bank. Give us that story because it's kind of interesting. Uh, uh, the the story about. Uh, uh, the the, the history of Great Barrington, no. the book. Yes, and how you didn't get in it. Yes, well, it was a, it's a marvelous book. I recommend it to anybody. The history of Great Barrington. It was published, oh, oh I think, uh, uh, about the year 2000, plus or minus. Mm -hmm. And it had a list of everybody from Great Barrington who was in World War II. And I looked through that and didn't see my name. And I've thought about it a few times and uh, came to the conclusion that since I was in the enlisted reserve, uh, I was not uh, um, uh, entering service through the draft board. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, uh, they might have missed me somehow. And then uh, when I realized that, then I thought, I wonder how many other fellows there are okay. who uh, were in the service but may have entered from some other area or something like that, but they still think of themselves as, as locals here. Mm -hmm. and, Where um, they live now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, there may be a, a number of people who really mm -hmm. would like to uh, um, um, be recognized as mm -hmm. having come from here yeah. well, into good. the service. There's something to do, fellas, if you've got a few moments you want to spend looking back on the history. Uh, 
not a zing forward, if you will. All uh, right. Your place of entry, if you will, or indoctrination, where and when, and a yeah. boot camp, if you want to yeah. call it that. Um, <clears throat> so when I was called to service uh, in uh, April of 43, uh, I went from Great Barrington to uh, Fort Devens, Massachusetts, and they gave me some tests there, and they said, oh, we think you ought to be in the Air Force Technical Training Command. And I thought I was going to end up as a, uh, a map maker down in Hawaii or something <laughs> like that. <laughs> but how different, you know, uh, life can be. I, I had my basic training at, um, uh, uh, oh, goodness, I can't remember the name now, near St. Louis. Okay, we'll buy that. And um, uh, went uh, from there. They shipped me off to the Army Specialized Training Program. Oh, ASTP, yeah. The ASTP, and uh, that's because I'd had uh, credit for two and a half years of college, and it was like going back to college. And I went to uh, the University of Minnesota, and uh, 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 they put me in civil engineering because I had had some enge uh, mechanical engineering, but I also transferred into architecture, and so civil engineering was pretty close. Pretty good cut, yeah. And uh, yeah. it was wonderful for me because uh, 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 each term at the University of Minnesota was equivalent to a whole year in regular college time. Ooh, squeeze it. Yeah, they really squeeze it together. And I had three terms, so I had sophomore, junior, senior courses in uh, civil engineering. All in uniform. All, all while I was in uniform. Great. And uh, <clears throat> some folks will wonder, well, why did they do that? That seems kind of, kind of um, um, a plush life compared to what some other guy had to do. Well, it turns out the ASTP program, as I see it, was really a, a, a proving ground for selecting men to go to various special projects like the Manhattan Project, oh. the atomic bomb. Some of the guys I know were assigned to the Manhattan Project from ASTP. Did they know at the time what they were being assigned to? They Strictly had hush -hush? no idea. They had no idea. Great. Yeah. And uh, so uh, uh, later, later on, we found out what the Manhattan Project yeah, was. The big boom. Yes. Anyway, uh, they finally disbanded that uh, um, ASTP program. And uh, everyone in my company at the University of Minnesota was transferred to the uh, 44th Infantry Division. And I think there were probably about 30 men who were friends of mine who were spread out all through that division. Mm -hmm. And there were two others in my company. Well, you had a little numeric, if you will, with respect to the oh, lucky four. The, the Give lucky that to four. the folks. That, that's <laughs> kind of a clue as to what's going to happen. Yes, it is, because uh, um, I, I, I believe in lucky numbers and I believe in luck. And I certainly had luck all the way through my whole service. Uh, but when, when we were transferred to the 44th Division, I looked at my orders, and there on the paper, it said that these were issued on the fourth day of the fourth month of the 44th year, and I was going to the 44th Division. Wow. <laughs> and <laughs> that seems somehow like, uh, like a coincidence of mm -hmm. numbers, and, and I took it as a, as a, a good omen. Amen. A good omen, and four has always been my lucky number ever since. And uh, so, uh, so yes, it, it did prove to be okay. such. I didn't uh, mean to interrupt, but it, 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 I yeah. read some of your background. I figured, you know, these little things got to be brought out and made a record. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Now that you're in it, did you actually have a choice, or did they send you where they wanted you? They sent me where they wanted me. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so I, Lady Luck was on your shoulder again? Yeah. Well, I, uh, Lady Luck, I said I would rather go to Europe than the Pacific. And I was lucky there. Okay. Yeah. Where did you, well, after you, your basic, where did, did you em, embark from uh, to well, Europe? Uh, when I went to the 44th, they were getting ready. It was the summer of 
45, I guess? No, 44. It was the okay. summer of 44. And uh, uh, that was in Salina, Kansas, Camp Phillips. And, and uh, uh, we did a lot of training there until it was time to get on a train. And, and the train took us through these beautiful hills all the way to Boston and, uh, and put us on a ship. And uh, the ship, uh, I understood, was uh, originally called the Casa Grande. It was an Italian luxury liner. Oh, you each had private staterooms and steward well, service? Well, <laughs> <laughs> we were crammed in <laughs> little rooms with about six guys per room. And uh, we were very, I was very lucky because uh, our, um, um, our battalion was given the MP duty on the ship. So we had to go stand guard at various stairways and doorways and mm -hmm. that sort of thing. And uh, ended up a couple of times being assigned to a doorway that had fresh air coming in. Oh, <laughs> that, that was always a welcome. <laughs> <laughs> that was so welcome. <laughs> yeah, down in the hold of the ship, it was. Uh, raunchy is a good it, word. It was very raunchy, mm -hmm. yes. Yes, yeah, and we, we landed in Cherbourg and uh, we're one of the first troop ships to land there in, uh, after the after D-Day. Uh -huh. But uh, that was about the middle of September. And then uh, we moved off the ship and into the, the um, uh, fields of the Normandy Peninsula. And uh, we stayed there uh, for about two weeks and uh, um, Eventually, we were again put on trains. These were the the uh, the train that would take us across France. Oh, the old forty and eights. The old forty and eights. Oh, good. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, <clears throat> forty men or eight horses yeah. in the boxcar. Well, we had we had thirty forty men from our company in one boxcar with all of our duffel bags and uh, <laughs> it was a little crowded a little crowded but we used to take turns sleeping on the top of the duffel bags and and look out the open doors as the train rolled along and uh, we ended up in over near Nancy and and uh, um, then we started hiking and we were hiking at night about 20 miles a night uh, and we'd camp in the woods and yeah. that sort of thing. Just and so they wouldn't see you coming. Yeah, they were trying to, to keep uh, the Germans from seeing the troop movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, uh, don't know that they did. Yep. You're here, so they must yeah. have not got you at least <laughs> once. <laughs> okay, then what happened? Well, we uh, mm -hmm. uh, went online relieving the Rainbow Division. And it had fought through uh, uh, all the way through Italy and up through southern France, and, and they needed a rest, by golly. <laughs> and, uh, mm -hmm. so, um, uh, so, so we replaced them on the front line, so-called, and it was that, uh, and it was a line because uh, there was very little action at that particular time, at that particular moment, and we ended up in foxholes <laughs> that those fellows had dug for us. But they, those foxholes were right on the line of some uh, First World War trenches. Wow. And that was kind of uh, spooky. spooky. Yeah. <laughs> you know? And uh, uh, we were on the edge of some trees. We were kind of hidden in the trees, but we could look down this uh, uh, long, long hillside to the east. And that's where they were. Where they were. Yeah. The, the Germans were over there someplace. and. Uh, um, one of the things that intrigued me was that I was hiking across that meadow one day and I saw something in the grass and I picked it up and it was a map. A map of the area, like a Coast and Geodetic Survey map. It had mm -hmm. an awful lot of details, uh, all the contours of the land and, and uh, it was very easy to spot my location on that map. Oh. And so I did. And then a couple of days later, I was early in the morning, I was looking out of my foxhole across down the hill and into the woods way beyond it. And a long ways away, I saw a little flash of light. 
And uh, shortly after that, I heard a mortar shell go over. Oh, and you, so, you being a spotter, didn't know it. Huh? Yeah, and, uh, <laughs> and, and I heard a little ping sound. And that was not the, the shell exploding, that was way behind me someplace. But the little ping sound was the sound of the mortar firing it. Oh. And uh, stop and think now. Uh, light travels very fast compared to sound. So I saw the little flash of light instantaneously. <laughs> and then I heard this little ping sound. And so there was a time delay. Okay, you could do a time study on it then. I did. I took out my watch and I timed it to how many seconds it was. Then I took out my uh, uh, compass and looked at the actual direction that it came from. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I put that on my map and drew a straight line. And I said, well, uh, Sound travels 1130 feet per second, and it took X. two or three seconds, yeah. I've forgotten now. So that made a, a distance for me. Okay, and you had direction already. I had direction and I had distance, and I put it on the map, and uh, I said, well, that's, that's where this little uh, uh, mortar emplacement is. And so I turned that over to the captain, and he said, well, let me take that map up to headquarters. And I heard three or four days later that they sent out a combat patrol and captured these, uh, the mortar oh, team. Good for you. So uh, I was, I didn't get my map back. Oh, well, you know, the Army's <laughs> like that. You know, it's Sesame Street all one way. <laughs> <laughs> that map would have been a good souvenir. Yeah. But uh, it didn't happen. And, uh, well, there any other instances like that that you might have, on that one particular map, spotted other emplacements? No, no, uh, but I could see what the countryside was yeah, like, good. you know, because the, the, it had the contours of the shape of the land and all that. Mm -hmm. and, and, oh, uh, real good. So your, your yeah. schooling came in handy right off oh, the yeah. bat, huh? <laughs> oh, great. Yeah, so that was, uh, then shortly after that, uh, uh, we had a big old meeting about uh, the fact that the division was going to now move. We were going to push against the Germans and see if we could uh, break through the German lines. Of course, you said, we were a line, you could tell that, but you couldn't see the Germans. They were way off a distance from us. In fact, uh, I guess I was, I figured out one time I was committed to frontline position, combat position, at least a hundred days out of that uh, uh, four or five months that, that I was in the region there. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was six or seven months, but anyway, a hundred days, and I never met a German person face to face. Well, you luck out, lady luck. Lady Luck was with me all the way, and you, you know, one wonders. And, and uh, that brings up another thought that here I am after all these years telling about this, telling some of my experiences. Shortly after the war, as a new civilian, college kid again and a working, young working man and so on. I could tell some of these stories because, as I say, I never met a German face to face, mm -hmm. so I didn't have the trauma. I only had the trauma of expecting it. That's even worse sometimes. You're always on but edge. I didn't want to tell my stories because I thought I might arouse memories in someone who didn't want to remember. Yeah. That happens. And now we can tell our stories. Yeah. Now it's a long, long time later, and it's time to tell our stories. Yeah. Before it's too late to tell yeah, them. Yeah, exactly. So, so here we are. Good. And uh, uh, so well, when you started your push, what kind of activity did you have, action? How far did you go, and where did you go? Well, <clears throat> we did push through, and uh, our battalion was one of the the lead battalions in that push. 
and as we pushed, you know, it's curious. I was a sergeant by that time, a squad leader, and yet I couldn't see the big picture. All mm -hmm. I could see was what was right around Your sector. me. Hmm. Yeah, you know, the woods and the farmhouses and that sort of thing that we went past or through. And we came to a point where we were kind of slowed down. And first thing I knew, here come a bunch of other companies from the rear coming through us and oh. pushing on. Yeah. And so um, uh, I guess there were even some tanks that went on through. And uh, we ended up, uh, uh, having been a spearhead, we ended up guarding the flanks of okay. this push. And Still the long line, the company front? Yeah. Did you say oh. something, you call it a marching front or something? It was oh. a new term, I hadn't heard that one. Yeah, that was three or four days later. Um, uh, guarding our flanks, we, were, we had to approach a town and there was some fighting in there and I, I was in F Company, but E Company of our battalion was kind of pinned down within half of this town. The Germans were in the other half of the town and the center of the town was on sort of on uh, the top of it was a, a top of a hill. It wasn't of a high hill or anything okay. like that. Little lump. <laughs> Little lump, yes. Uh, and uh, we were pretty much coming along a road, and uh, they they got us all to get off the road and into the woods. And then they said, uh, "We're going to use a new formation." as we enter this town, something that we never had in training. It's called marching fire. Yeah, okay. And we came to the edge of the woods and we all spread out so that no one was behind anybody else, so to speak. They're shooting them in the butt. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And as we marched out of those woods and across the meadow and up to the buildings of this village, we were firing our rifles continuously, just bullet after bullet after bullet, any place we thought the Germans could be hiding. Uh -huh. okay. I picked a, a tower of a church. Good spot for the observers, could, huh? Because there would be observers there uh, and shot at a, a, a louver where they could be looking out. And, and mm -hmm. I don't know whether my rifle bullets hit that louver or not, but I hope they did. Yeah. Anyway, we... Uh, uh, we had this marching, so everybody was marching, and some were a little bit behind the others. It wasn't just a straight line. Okay. It was a, a very scattered line, so that uh, uh, we were a, a difficult target. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we kept firing, and we all moved up to the village and, and came in the back of some houses. And these houses were... Uh, pretty well secured by the previous fighting of E Company. And so we moved into uh, one of those houses and, and uh, 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 you know, it's interesting the way those, those villages were built. There'd be the house and attached to the house would be a barn. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. And next to the barn would be the next house. And Is that a common almost, wall? And so there were common walls yeah. all the way down the street. And so we went into the barn from the back, and uh, uh, of course the people, the villagers who had, who were not in evidence, could go out onto the street, or they could go back into the meadow. So they were using meadow for their farming. And anyway, we uh, we found that uh, we could go upstairs to the very attic of this house. We could move a little tile from the roof and we could see down ah, into the good street. Old P. Yeah. And so we had our own ob observation yeah. point. And uh, as night came on, turned out there was a house further up the street that was on fire, so that the street was really lit up. And uh, we could see whether anything was going on, uh -huh. you know. But the, the next day, uh, why, uh, uh, the, that, this is, this is the story of where my purple heart came from. <laughs> Tell it any way the, you will, buddy. The next day, uh, a couple of uh, our soldiers <clears throat> from one of the other companies 
came in the back and they said, does anybody have any bazooka ammunition? We need bazooka rounds. And I said, no. Everybody looked, no, we don't have any bazooka in this company. But I said, well, I have some anti-tank grenades. Oh, rifle grenades? Uh, yes, yeah. rifle grenades uh, that, that uh, use a, a blank cartridge and it fires the thing off the end of the rifle. Mm -hmm. And um, so I went with them up about three houses using the, the, the back alley behind us mm -hmm. and went in. And here in the living room, I call it the living room, it was the front room. And uh, the glass was gone, broken out. And right there in the street, 20 feet away, was a German tank with an enormous hole in the side because they had the bazooka and they had used it and they fired it right into the side of the tank. And they killed a bunch of Germans. Um, and there sat the tank. And then there was another German tank up behind it. And it wanted to get into a position where it could fire at us. And um, I lay down in the doorway, the front door that went out onto the street. And I lay down in the doorway and put the, the rifle butt up against the door jam close to the floor where I could fire these. these uh, a good butt for it. Huh? Yeah. Huh? I could just get a little line of sight, you know. And um, so I thought, well, I can fire my anti-tank grenades with a, with, a, with a rifle grenade launcher. And so the first one hit the front of this tank, but there was no bang. It just fell. And Dud? I realized I'd forgotten to pull the pin. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I had two more. Oh. So put the next one on, pulled the pin, fired it, and it went off with a terrible racket right on the front of this tank. And of course, that was heavy steel and concrete armor on the front mm -hmm. of the tank. So this little... Bounced right off. Well, it made a hell of a racket, and they immediately backed up that tank. And as they were backing up, I put the other one in and tried to shoot for the, for the treads. Mm -hmm. And I missed the treads because it was moving, but the but the thing went off underneath the tank, in the in the cobblestones uh, of the street, and made a lot of noise. And that tank kept backing up some more. And so that was all I could do, because I just had three of them. And um, I was uh, standing up in the living room talking with these other soldiers, and suddenly this disabled tank started to move. But he didn't get them all in. So there was somebody who was recovering from shock who was the driver, and he was still in there. And he moved that tank into some empty space that was opposite of our building, across the street from our building. And he backed it into there, and so here was this <laughs> muzzle of the tank 88 rifle, whatever mm -hmm. it's called, on the, yeah. on the German tank, facing right into our room. And so we got out of that building in a hurry. And I went back down to uh, our barn. And I realized it was so early in the morning, I hadn't put my rifle belt on. And so I got back there, and I found my rifle belt. And I was buckling the rifle belt like this. I had both hands right there at my stomach when that second German tank fired one of their 88s into the doorway of our barn. And we had probably 30 men in there. And one other person got wounded. He got hit pretty badly in the stomach and our first aid man went right to him. And uh, his name was Sergeant Berg and he got hit, uh, as I say, pretty badly. And, and uh, uh, I got hit right here on the wrist, and it started to bleed. I also got hit on the foot. Somehow it felt like I'd been hit on the bottom of my shoe with a baseball bat. Ooh. And, you know, I look at my foot, no blood, no problem. I was walking, but it just about knocked me down. Anyway, 
I said, I'm finding a first aid man. And I went down the hill on the back of those buildings where the Germans couldn't see me. And uh, I looked for an aid man. And here came a fella, kind of, kind of chubby guy with a, a beard, uh, uh, not as beautifully well kept as yours, sir. Thank you, sir. <laughs> But this was a beard that had been grown over several months, mm. and uh, uh, he had a helmet on with a with a, um, a, a red cross on oh, it. Oh yeah, bingo, bingo! The target. The target, and uh, so I said, "Medic, medic, I need help." And he looked at me and he said, "Where is your rifle belt? Where's your first aid pouch, soldier?" And I said, Bill, what are you doing? He said, who are you? So I told him. And then he laughed, because we had been buddies. And I recognized his voice, but I didn't recognize his face because of that beard. Uh -huh. But well, I recognized his voice. From where? From the ASTP program. Oh, for God's sakes. A small world gets smaller. Exactly. Yeah. And he'd chew you out or fix you up? He or fixed both. Me up. He <laughs> fixed me up beautifully. We went inside the building. and. He found some more first aid pouches, and he really took care of my hand and put some of that powder in on the wound. Mm -hmm. and, and I said, you know, I think I got hit in the foot, too. And we took off my shoe pack. That's what we were wearing, those, those big, high, rubber-laced yeah. hunting boots. Yeah. L.L. Bean special. <laughs> exactly. Well, the ones that were issued to me were a little large, so I'd put two um, inner soles in them. So I had double padding. That saved your butt. It saved my foot. Yeah. Uh, what happened was uh, we took the boot off, and here was all this blood. And he looked at the bottom of it, and he said, well, a little piece of shrapnel just cut through the, the, the soft spot behind your toe, behind your big toe. But uh, I don't think it entered. And, and later on, we found that piece of shrapnel in the boot. Oh. In the in the, uh, the inner second soul, in the second inner soul, and I came pretty close to being hit in the toe. Oh. So anyway, again, lady luck, you yeah. know. So uh, put the boot back on again, and uh, and he said, you go on down the hill a little bit, cross the street, you'll be out of sight of the Germans. And you go through those field, and he said, pretty soon you'll you you keep walking, you will find. Uh, first aid. A field hospital of kind. Yeah. Well, what I found was an ambulance and a little group of medics. And they put me in the ambulance and they took me away to a field hospital. And so that night in this field hospital, I was very much impressed with the field hospital. It was really quite uh, um, a, a great experience, a morale booster to see what the they had waiting for us wounded guys. So they took the shrapnel out of my wrist and, and um, had me all bandaged up. And I woke up the next morning and, and they sent me off to a station hospital where I was in a real <clears throat> army bed in a building, in a Clean ward. sheets. Clean sheets, nice building, pretty nurses. And it was a far cry from what I'd just been through. Mm -hmm. And so I was there for two or three weeks. Wow. And uh, recovered enough that they sent me back. They said, you mean I got to go back to that mess? <laughs> <laughs> and so, yeah, I, I went back. And uh, let's see, if I were to put some dates on this, it was in November around Thanksgiving when I got wounded. And I was in the hospital at Christmas, and I was out of the hospital just before New Year's. And uh, so <clears throat> 1945 dawned, and I was still trying to get back to the company, looking for a ride here or a ride yeah. there to get back, and following orders and so forth. and. What happened was I was back in the area, but I was not in the battle. This is Lady Luck again. The worst battle that my company ever had to go through was New Year's Eve, 
that New Year's Eve. And uh, some of the fellows that I knew died that night. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Germans were trying to open up a, another uh, bulge, yeah. like the famous bulge. Yeah. They tried to open up another one, and it was called Nordwind, I found out. That was the German name for it, uh, for, for that push. But uh, E Company and F Company and uh, other parts of our battalion and our division uh, resisted it enough that it was blunted and stopped. Good. And uh, the fellows who lived through that battle, and there were a lot of them, there weren't too many. There were a few wounded and a few dead, but uh, uh, the ones that, that uh, I got to talk with uh, said that the Germans in a snowstorm came on wearing white robes so they couldn't be seen, hardly, and they were hopped up, and I found that was true in the records that I have read on the web, that uh, the, the, when they made this attack, they, they might even have been drugged. Just to keep them going. To keep them going, and, and my men said they had to shoot these white apparitions about three times to get them to fall wow. down. And uh, so that was pretty rough. Yeah. And we got pushed off a hillside a little bit and, and we tried to get the hillside back again later on, and we did. Is that when they put you in for OCS? Um, it, it was shortly after that, yes. That was, it. that was probably in February. And the, towards the end of February, I was notified that uh, I'd better come back to the company headquarters because they'd put my name in for, for officer candidate school. One of the other fellows from the ASTP program who was in the company, and it was um, an older fella, more mature. Was he about 22, 23? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was, uh, let's see, I guess I was about 22. And uh, he must have been 24, 25, something Real old like timer. that. And uh, he was given a, a battlefield commission, but I was sent back to OCS. And I was just delighted. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, uh, it, it took a while. Uh, I was at company headquarters in a safe place uh, behind the lines for about a week, and then regimental headquarters, and then division headquarters, and then the orders came through, up, huh? and, and uh, uh, they took me uh, back into France. And well, no, we were in France, and uh, but but further west. And uh, it turned out that the officer candidate school was at um, uh, Fontainebleau. Oh, rough duty. Rough duty. Well, <laughs> the, the castle or the palace there at Fontainebleau is perfectly gorgeous. And I saw it, but that's all. I didn't live in it. No. Oh. No, you see, um, back about the time when that was built, they had uh, uh, all kinds of... Uh, uh, soldiering to guard the palace, and they had uh, um, uh, a, a very fine uh, cavalry unit there in those way, way, way back. So uh, they had stables, and up above the stables were the the, the uh, dormitories for for the soldiers who were the cavalry. Yeah. So that's where we were. Still wasn't rough duty though. It was. It was very. Very, it was fun duty. Yeah. As I told you before, I love working with maps. And uh, a lot of, uh, of our uh, training was orientation and movement of troops. Uh -huh. So we were moving theoretical troops as part of OCS um, through the forest of Fontainebleau, which was extensive woods, crisscrossed by all kinds of of trails. Some of them were walking trails, some of them were wagon trails, some of them were carriage roads. And wherever they crossed, if they had any importance, there was a statue there. Oh. It was really quite beautiful. Tour of history, really. So uh, uh, we had these points of, of uh, uh, position on the map. 
and and we were supposed to find them, and this was part oh. of our. So we did maneuvering through the woods, and I thought that was fun. And uh, eventually, uh, of course, uh, by by the time we finished at OCS, uh, the German had surrendered, they had been beaten, and uh, the war was over in Europe. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And then uh, suddenly here was all this news about dropping some bombs on, on Japan and the, the, the atomic bombs and, and so forth, and, and then pretty, you know. So I was getting out of OCS when the war was over. Good deal, good yes, deal. It really was, and, and I ended up uh, um, not going back to the 44th, I would like to have, because I saw them going back to, the, to uh, uh, get on a boat and go home. Go home, yeah. But I didn't. Uh, I got reassigned to the 83rd Division, and that was, uh, uh, that was fine, but that ended up in uh, southeastern Germany, not far from Austria. And eventually, I moved into Austria. Uh, in reading, I'm, I'm not cutting you short, but in some of your travelogue, if you will, uh, somewhere, somehow, you managed to con somebody into setting up a ski school or a ski rest. How about that, R&R? &R? All right. Um, war was over, and uh, we, we were uh, positioned down in Upper Austria, mm -hmm. not very far from the Alps. I mean, a uh, couple of hours by car, and we were in the Alps. And the, uh, they had a program that they were trying to set up. They asked if anybody wanted to teach uh, 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 high school courses. And I said, I, I could teach uh, geometry. I loved geometry. So I said, if you have a school, uh, if you set up classes, I'll be glad to try that. And, and I ended up being assigned uh, uh, the I and E officer. That meant information and education. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> the, the, the colonel uh, of our battalion said, Oh, this is great. We've got an organization now. We'll use it and we'll, we'll get a ski school and we'll teach skiing. That's what we'll do. Oh. <laughs> and, and somehow or other, one of the, the other officers, a southerner, awful nice guy, uh, spoke up and said, well, he understood German beautifully because he'd run a German prison camp so he could learn the language. Uh -huh. And he could tell where people came from in Germany. And anyway, he, he moseyed around town and he found out that there was a fellow there who was a mountain master, uh, an Austrian, who knew the Alps intimately and was well honored because he had rescued a whole bunch of mountain climbers that had fallen into a crevasse. Ooh. This was sometime before the war, okay. probably. But anyway, uh, we, we brought him on board as part of a, a team. And so Lieutenant Almond, this fella, and I went exploring. And we found we could go to a little village in the Alps, a little village called Ebensee, E-B-E-N-S-E-E. -E and take a cable car up the top of a mountain. The mountain was called Firekugel. And um, uh, up on top of the mountain, it, it, there was a hotel. Convenient. And so we go up there, and the Air Force had already found it, but they wanted to share it. They knew they had to. Oh, okay. <laughs> and so they shared it with us, and we were getting ready to set up the ski school, and we'd done some skiing and so forth. Uh, and um, uh, with the help of this Austrian guy, we got uh, all the skis and boots and poles and things that we needed. And, and uh, um, so, so that was a part of my army of occupation. Rough duty, huh? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, uh, so we went along and, and uh, 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 this looked so good to the people up there at regiment that they wanted me to come up there and, and be I and E officer for the regimental headquarters. Wow. So I got pulled up to regiment and uh, I was just a second lieutenant and there was a first lieutenant who didn't have much of a job and he said he wanted my job. Okay, yes sir. <laughs> yes sir. <laughs> first thing I knew, they had assigned me to personnel. I was no longer. 
And uh, I uh, thought, well, you know, I think I'll speak up. I want to go back to battalion. I can be uh, any officer at battalion. I can work mm -hmm. under this first lieutenant. So uh, I went to the uh, regimental commander and asked for an interview, and I got it. And I said, I can understand what's going on here, but I'd like to go back to my battalion. Can't, can't you cut me orders to send me back to battalion? And uh, he uh, said, no, he said, there's too much going on right now. We've got to keep you where we are. I said, well, I'm afraid I'm going to make a mess of things at personnel. I'm, that's not my field. I'm not a lawyer type. I'm not a, <laughs> a, 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 a someone who works with paper and names and words and numbers and stuff like that. And uh, so he said, well, OK, but just hang in there. And a week later, I found out that that division, the 83rd, was being sent back to the United States. But I didn't have enough points. Well, they were 55 and 50. Yeah, I had 50 points, and, and, and I needed 55 points to go, go home. So I had to stay. Well, there were probably a dozen of us officers who couldn't go home. And so we had to be reassigned someplace. And six of us went to the city of Vienna, to the Vienna Area Command. And I, uh, I still think that it happened because uh, I uh, spoke to the, to the uh, colonel. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, that, that's, uh, that, that's how I ended up in Vienna. <laughs> yeah. Well, wasn't that where, you, if I remember right, you said you'd met somebody at an uh, officer's club and you yeah. got a presidential citation yeah. that gave well, you the fat man. That's five. right. I, I had no idea that I should be wearing the presidential unit citation. But, but that uh, New Year's Eve battle had that earned us that yeah. award. And, and when I was in Vienna, I happened to walk into an officer's club and I saw a colonel with the 44th Infantry Division patch on his shoulder. And I went up to him and I recognized him. It was Colonel McKee from our battalion. And he said, why aren't you wearing the presidential unit citation? I said, I have no idea that I'm eligible. And he said, oh, yes, you are. You were with Remember us Remember the then. outfit. And so a week later, uh, I received in the mail the orders where he had gone to personnel and vouched that, that I should have it. And so then the, the blessed thing was that was worth five points. Yeah. And so I now had 55 points, and I could go home. Johnny comes marching home. <laughs> Let's cut there. I, I want the people to see some of your fruit salad. I'll hold this up. I'm a good holder. I'm letting practice. And if you will, okay. walk us through, if you will. All right. There's the shoulder patch for the 44th Infantry Division. Over here at the top is the combat infantry badge. And uh, I really feel as though that is the thing on this plaque that I am the most proud of. Uh, I have heard that it's equal to a bronze star if you go through the right channels. But oh. I haven't done that, but, no, no. but I don't need to. And then underneath it right here, uh, is the presidential unit citation. The, the five-pointer. And uh, uh, over, over on this side is a, a, a regimental badge, and I thought that might be for the 71st Infantry, which was my uh, regiment in the 44th, but it turns out uh, it's a different design. I just discovered that, and I don't have one to put in this full thing. This one is probably for the 329th, which was uh, the regiment of the 83rd. This is the shoulder patch for the 83rd down here. Mm -hmm. Over here on the far right, the red, white, and blue shoulder patch was the Vienna Area Command. Oh. Now, right in here, these ribbons um, are the Purple Heart, Good Conduct Medal, uh, um, um, the American uh, Theater of, uh, of Operations mm -hmm. ribbon. Then this one is Europe, Africa, and uh, Middle Eastern ribbon with three little stars. And then 
the Victory Ribbon, Victory in Europe, World War II Victory Ribbon, and then finally the Army of Occupation Ribbon. So those are the ribbons that I was able to wear when I left the service. Good. And as I left the service, I became a first lieutenant, so there's uh, my, the silver my, bar. my silver bar and, and my crossed rifles for the infantry. Yeah. So that tells it pretty much. Yeah, and somewhere in the background, there's a little hallowed lady luck. Yes. PYA. <laughs> okay, now that you're home, how about what's happened since then? You're home. As far as your family, your friends, and well, what have you. How do you uh, feel about that? Uh, uh, I had a sweetheart in college, and we got married, and we had children, uh, uh, a daughter, a son, and a daughter, and, and uh, they're all doing their own things. They're grown up, and they have... That happens. And it does, and the youngest one has uh, two sons who are now in college, and, and one of them's a junior at Cornell where I went, and, and he's doing just fine. The other one is just starting as a sophomore, and... and um, uh, so yes, life has been good. I, I went back to college right after the war and got my degree in architecture. And then thanks to the, the uh, GI Bill of Rights. Amen. I want to say something about the GI Bill of Rights. It was the best thing that ever was done after the war because there were so many, many men who were eager for an education who went to college, thanks to the GI Bill mm -hmm. of Rights, and they have made their mark in this country, and they've done well. Yeah. And uh, I was very lucky because it allowed me to go to graduate school, and I thought I wanted to teach. So I got a, a degree at, uh, in architecture, master's in architecture at uh, MIT. Ooh. And I went down to Texas, to the University of Texas, and taught there for a few years, and realized that uh, you have to have some experience to speak from. So uh, uh, I uh, got back into architecture. Oh, this is getting to be a long story about peacetime, isn't it? Uh, it well, that's, that's what all, all right. we got left, let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> I got sidetracked out of architecture into consulting work in architectural acoustics. And I became a consultant to other architects all the way around, everywhere in Texas and all the way east and west. And um, uh, did that and, and uh, about 35 years of consulting work. And wow. that was my major contribution to, to our economy, worked well, on. Obviously, you've done a good job <laughs> from your experience and what you said. Yeah. Now, uh, you retired supposedly, which means you got so many things to do you can't do it all in one in one that day. That is true. But what's your avocation? I understand you're pretty good at painting and drawing, as the kid <laughs> said. Well, all the time I was in business, I'd say I know what I'm going to do when I retire. I want to be a painter in fine arts. Of course, through architecture, I I couldn't talk without a pencil, so I was always drawing things. Okay. And in fact, in architecture, you draw buildings that were never built. So I didn't have to look at something to draw it. Okay, you had it I up had here. It, I, I would draw from what I saw in my yeah. head. Yeah. And uh, um, a lot, an awful lot of my uh, drawing has been that way. But uh, I went into watercolors and eventually into pastels, and I love both media. Good. And I do a lot of work in those. I'm very active with the uh, uh, um, Housatonic Valley Art League. It used to be the oh. Sheffield Art League. Yeah. I'm very active with that group. And uh, so uh, that's, uh, that's been very rewarding. But I've got all kinds of hobbies that I do yeah. besides the painting. Everything spreads out, right? Everything spreads yeah. out. I, I love writing. I've written up the, uh, a lot of of uh, what I've told you today. Yeah, and I appreciate it. Uh, I've written it up uh, because my grandsons wanted it. Yeah. That's a silly question, but I, that's what got me hooked in doing this. Yeah. Uh, we're lucky. We, have, we had 10, one little guy didn't make it. Oh. So we have nine. Yes. And we get together every three or four years. And, and the name of the game with my kids is the odd year they go with their in-laws, the even, even Stephen, 
yeah. they come and see us. <laughs> <laughs> when they all get together with their friends and their <laughs> telephones and all that, it, it's, it's organized terrible. chaos, but it's wonderful. Sure and one is. time, we're just sitting around before we went to Sunday school, uh, church, uh, Christmas Eve. One of the kids said, hey, Grandpa, what did you do in the war? And yeah. I said, well, what do you mean? He said, well, we, we'd like to know. You never talk about it. So yeah. I says, well, which war? <laughs> the one I was in, there had been five or six after it. Now, what do you want to know about my war or somebody else's war? I said, well, you know, the stuff. Well, uh, I gave him a little song and dance. And I got some help from the guys up at, in the Dalton who'd done the, yeah. the same kind of show. And yeah. after it was over, believe it or not, I felt good. There's some things I'll never tell anybody. Yeah, but sure. But that, and it, it, it just seemed to make yeah. things go. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Same thing with me. My younger grandson said, what was the name of your division? And I said, the 44th. Okay. Yeah. Press the fresh, my friend. We've got to say <laughs> goodbye. And, but I thank you very much for coming and sharing it's it with us. It's been a pleasure. Amen. We'll a go have a beer pleasure. someday. Well, why not? Okay, I'll <laughs> buy. <laughs> Folks, unfortunately, we're, we're running out of time again. But again, this is another little slice of history that we're glad that we can share with you, with guys like Dave and all the others. If you're interested, please come and see us, particularly you gals. You did a lot of work that none of you seem to want to talk about. We'll help you do it, if you will. Bob Steves saying thank you. Come back and hear us again next time. Goodbye. <laughs>